first, I want to introduce Linda Golder Blount, who I mentioned earlier. She's president and CEO of Black Women's Health Imperative. Her talk, as you are about to see, is called Transform the Narrative of Women's Health, Keeping Women and Their Communities at the Center. So, Linda is the, as I said, president and CEO of the only existing in this country organization completely dedicated to black women's health. Emotional, physical, mental, financial health. Quite remarkable. And Linda leads a really vibrant organization. Check them out on the website. It's an amazing website. And what you'll notice is that Linda is known there as uh, the black magic woman. Do I have that right? And for really good reason, as you're about to experience. Linda, welcome. Um, good morning. I am so happy to be here and so excited about all the work that you all are about to do. Um, when we had some planning sessions, of course, leading up to this, Lois assured me that in this room, we solve the problems of the world. So we have until tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Press will be waiting outside <laughs> to do the interviews. Um, so get ready. Um, thank you for, for letting me be here. Just a, a little bit about the Black Women's Health Imperative. As Lois said, we're the only national organization with this focus on Black Women's Health. And for 35 years, we've been the only one, which is for me both frightening and saddening to think that after 35 years there's still only one national organization with this focus. But it's also very daunting because there's a lot to do. So we spend a lot of time translating research into language the everyday woman can understand so she knows what to do. Um, we spend a lot of time translating research into policy <coughs> and providing evidence to policymakers so they too hopefully know what to do. And we invest in programs across the country so that we can hopefully give black women the information, the tools, the resources they need to do what they want to do anyway, which is to be as healthy as they possibly can. To help them understand that there are very real barriers and that the poor health that we talk about among black women, among Latinas, among Native women and other women is not their fault. Because that's the message that they get. So, let's see, I want to start here. What brings me here? Um, two months ago, my daughter Stephanie got married. Two years ago, my son Joe got married. So, Steph married Joe, Joe married Laura. Stephanie's middle name is Laura. So I'm here, I can call any name somebody's going to answer. <laughs> but I, I, I say this because both Steph and Laura are going to be thinking about having children soon. And I have to really be careful because of what I know. I don't want to make them crazy. <laughs> but Laura is of Filipino descent. And so her risk for gestational diabetes is high. Stephanie is a well-educated, upper middle class black woman. Her risk for dying after childbirth is really high. I can't say this to these girls. But you can bet that when I get the call that they're pregnant, I'm you know, going to be like this. So I'm happy to be here so that we can do the work that needs to be done so that I don't have to worry about Steph and Laura, and that you don't have to worry about the other young women in your lives. Okay. So Hopefully these slides will just run and I won't have to pay much attention to this. But, but I, what I want to talk about is the opportunity to change the narrative, to begin this conversation, and I, I like this Laura Neil Hurston quote, um, about why we're here. Um, so we need to change this narrative about women and their health and their values. If, if, I don't care if well, any of you notice that there are some people in this dome building that's down the street from, from our offices in D.C. who don't seem to care much about women. 
Okay. And these slides are going much too fast, so we'll figure out how to make that work. Um, and what I want you, you all to think about is what we bring to our healthcare experience. So we can do that by putting women really at the center of the conversation. We can start by you know, honoring the women who came before us, and these women and these slides, who did the really hard work to get the conversation going, and talk about the women who fought to make sure that we had access to prenatal care, who wondered why women were dying in childbirth and right after childbirth. The women who looked at systems of care delivery and, and said, well, what's happening in the exam? What's happening when women go to the pharmacy? What's happening when they go online and look for health, health information? And I want us to think about the research and those people who finally decided that there was a difference between women and men, and male and female, that, that when they were doing initial experimentation with mice, they didn't need to only have male mice, that somehow female mice were, were important. And that those who decided that risk that, that being black is not a risk factor, that ethnicity is important, and that black women don't have whatever it is they have because they're black. It's because of the experience of being black in the society. And I, and I want to think about the people who understood this and considered this in research and thought that perhaps the lived experiences, as Janine mentioned, were really important in research. And I also want us to, to, to know that researchers bring their own lived experiences to their work. So what questions get asked? Who asks the questions? What becomes what we call evidence? Depends on who's funded to do the work and what their interest is. So we've got to think about what we mean when we say evidence. We in public health talk about evidence, but who are we really talking about? So here's the current narrative. We have an HPV vaccine that's not as, as effective in black girls because it doesn't address some of the strains that are more common in black girls. Breast cancer incidence is rising among black women. Why? And yet, we've got 28% or so of breast cancer that occur in black women that occur in women younger than 50. But the Preventive Services Task Force, the American Cancer Society, has said, oh, let's raise the age of screening mammography to 50, based on studies done in Sweden and Canada. Where I'm guessing there weren't that many black <coughs> women. But that's evidence. 40 million women are at risk, are pre-diabetic and at risk for developing diabetes. And yet, when we applied for our most recent diabetes prevention grant from CDC, we had to word it so that we couldn't actually say African American. You couldn't say Hispanic Latino. You, you had to come up with these euphemisms for describing the populations you're going to work on, work on. Whereas four years ago when we did it, we could be very explicit about who we were intending to work with and focus on. The life expectancy of Whites is dropping. We've all read that. So we've got young children now who are being left behind, left without mothers because of suicide or opioid misuse, and opioid misuse combined with anti-anxiety drugs. This is really scary. So, you know, and these are women who actually have resources. Can you imagine the low-income woman who's got to choose between trying to work to get her Medicaid so that she can get treatment for her substance abuse issues. So all of this is sort of against the, the backdrop. I mean, you, one would think this would be a national priority. With, you know, opioid misuse is in the news all the time. You would think this would be a national priority. And yet the Office of Women's Health, after one and a half years, still doesn't have a director. In clinical trials, in clinical research, we get requests all the time. You know, could you serve up, provide women for our clinical trial? My answer is always no. I don't want to tap an agency. 
But I'm happy to talk about why you are calling me in the first place, because you can't find black women or Latinas to be in the clinical trial. So far, no one has taken me up on that offer. And we get requests all the time to tailor materials. Well, we've got this campaign. We'd like to tailor, we'd like you to tailor the materials. And again, my answer is always no. If you didn't design those materials for black women with black women in mind in the first place, or that Tina's in mind in the first place, then we can't go back and swap out the pictures and make them okay. That's not how it works. And then there's maternal mortality. Lois mentioned, Janine mentioned, everybody's gonna talk about this. And, and Janine gave you some statistics. One, I'll just put a finer point on it. In New York, the black-white difference is 12 times in New York City. So we've known this for a long time. There's research, Arlene Geronimus, Tanae Lewis, Fleeta Master Jackson, the Black Women's Health Study have all looked at toxic environmental stress, the experience of being a black woman, and what that means for low birth weight babies, for maternal mortality, for gestational diabetes. And yet, here we are, still having this conversation. And Arlene Geronimus' research goes back to 1994. So it's not like we're just finding this out. But Stephen Covey said, and I, I'm not a huge Covey fan, but it seemed appropriate today. Um, you know, when talking about sort of coming up with a new narrative, he said, start with the end in mind. So I say, start with women in mind. All women, black, white, Hispanic, native, young, old, rich, poor, Asian. Start with what they bring to this. And as, as you all think about your work today and tomorrow, just always center the woman. What would she think? What does she bring? What does this mean for her? Consider her lived experiences. A friend of mine said to me not too long ago, you yeah, know, women aren't crazy. But we in public health and medicine sometimes treat women like they're crazy. Well, why don't they just eat right? Why don't they exercise? Why don't they? Well, the fact is they, whoever they is, are doing what, doing their best. They're living their lives. They're, they're doing their best. They're really trying. But they also live in an environment that makes that a real challenge. They're caring, as Jenny mentioned, they're caring for families. They're working multiple jobs. They might be the sole breadwinner, and they want to do things to, to make them to, to be as healthy as possible. And they're making the best decisions they can. So at the, at the end of the day, though, we all do what we value. And, and we talk about behavior change. Well, the key to behavior change is make the benefit of that change behavior greater than the cost of not changing. And that it works. I mean, my mother smoked for 30 years. When my brother had the first grandchild, his wife had the first grandchild, she came to visit. He said, Mom, you can't smoke. She never touched another cigarette after that. Didn't care, didn't miss it. Because the value of being with that grandbaby was much higher than whatever benefit she was getting from smoking. That's the easy stuff. The hard part, though, is how to make the value of women so important that systems of care and education and wealth and revenue generation change. How do we make that happen? Because that's the real, that's the chasm. So you all are here to help bridge this chasm. One that drops women off right after childbirth, one that separates them from basic health care, one that separates them from their ability to make the best health care decisions, and one that keeps them out of research and keeps them out of what we call evidence. <coughs> so we need to um, have an army of women and men in this work. But what I say is we need street fighters with a vocabulary. <laughs> so to keep women up front and center, act at the middle of the conversation to understand what it is about their lives that can help them be healthy. And I need us all to work together to do that so that Serena won't have to worry with her next child. So 
Kira Johnson and Shalone Irving's mothers won't have to worry that their daughters died in vain. So that I don't have to worry about Steph and Lauren. So that every woman and girl can know that the care she receives is based in science and practice that began with her in mind first. So I'm excited to be here. The, the panel is amazing. They let me come. This is the, the panel is fantastic. Um, but I'm really excited about all the work that you're going to do. Lois, thank you for bringing us together um, to have this exchange of ideas. And I just want to take a, a quick poll. So who in this room thinks anything is wrong with women? Right. And yet the message we get is something's wrong. This woman knows that's not the case. Thank you.